So far, we've been looking at schools that follow the lineage from Socrates, uh, who was the teacher of Plato, Plato then who was the teacher of Aristotle, and now we are going to look at the wider Hellenistic philosophies, as they're called. There are many different uh, philosophies in the Hellenistic world, which of course does include ancient Greece um, and uh, when Plato and Aristotle were alive, but typically we refer to the Hellenistic uh, philosophies or philosophers as those which really become dominant after uh, Plato and Aristotle. Now, there are different schools like Neoplatonists who take a certain interpretation of Plato and they kind of run with it, uh, a lot of times in a more religious and especially later on Christian uh, interpretation of Plato that is very much influential to St. Augustine and his philosophy. There is the school of the Stoics who were very much influenced originally by the Cynics, um, and there's the most famous Cynic, Diogenes um, of, of Sinope, whose nickname was the Dog. Uh, Diogenes is a fascinating character, but what concerned the Cynics was how to live uh, the best life, or how to live virtuously. And they did this by trying to be in accord with nature as much as possible and rejecting a uh, conventional uh, life that you find in like an urban context. So um, uh, Diogenes the dog would um, do things like live in a barrel, right? Um, he would just, if he felt an urge, he would just go with the urge, whatever that may be. Um, he did not follow customs. And many of them would actually train in environments that would really put their physical body um, under pressure, like maybe running through, you know, barefoot through like a hot desert or, or you know, sand or whatever it may be. So that way they could um, best uh, attune their body to the natural environment. Um, the Stoics were influenced by the Cynics, but they become kind of, they become concerned with living virtuously. Uh, meaning in accord with nature, but of course they don't take this kind of radical uh, anti-civilization uh, view. Instead, um, they focus on uh, training the mind and not being uh, so attached to uh, opinions or beliefs of others. And, and so you have famous um, Stoics like Epictetus and uh, or, or even the Roman Emperor, actually, so they're there was an actual philosopher king at one time, um, Marcus Aurelius, and they really argue things like um, you should train your mind such that, like if you're gonna if you're driving to work and you're running into traffic, right? Like, is it your fault there's traffic? Well, if you left late and you ran into the traffic, right? Then yeah, it's your fault. But why would you be mad about that? Because you can't change it. So you know, don't get mad. Uh, about things like that, uh, continue on in the future to reflect on it to improve yourself. Or if it wasn't your fault, well, why would you get mad when things are out of your control anyways, right? And in this way, we can live, live more virtuously because we don't let our uh, bodily, physical urges control us, and instead we follow reason. Uh, there's another school, the Epicureans. The Epicureans... Uh, argued that to live virtuously is to maximize pleasure, but you do so not in a kind of uh, straight like maximalist hedonist way where you just like have sex all the time and eat a bunch of food and things like that. But instead you, you learn to take pleasure in the little things so that way you're always being pleased by things and never disappointed um, in that way. And they all, these different schools, you know, besides these different ethical views, they have uh, varying epistemological uh, epistemologies as well and metaphysics um, but what we're going to look at right now is actually one of two skeptic uh, traditions that emerged in the ancient Greek and Roman world and specifically we're going to look at in this lecture video Sextus Empiricus so Sextus Empiricus was a Roman doctor actually and he in the ancient world, wrote the uh, greatest uh, treaties on uh, treatises on Peronian skepticism, and we'll see exactly what is Peronian skepticism. You know, how is that different from other kinds of skepticisms? Uh, so we'll look at that in a moment. But 
uh, he was influenced by uh, a Greek named Pyrrho. And so he claims lineage then to a certain kind of skepticism promoted by Pyrrho. Uh, Pyrrho never actually wrote anything down, so all of it was, you know, in a way, uh, hearsay. Um, it was uh, uh, transmitted by others and what they knew about him. So some of the stories are, you know, probably exaggerated about, about Pyrrho. But nonetheless, right, the same can be said of Socrates. And as we'll see, it's a common theme that uh, the different Hellenistic philosophies that really take hold uh, after Plato and Aristotle all try to claim lineage to Socrates, just like uh, Plato did. Um, so in the case of the Stoics, right, they claim, well, well, you know, Socrates really was a Stoic. In the case of uh, the academic skeptics, as we'll see in a moment, they claimed, ah, well, Socrates says the only thing he knows is that he knows nothing, so he must have definitely been an academic skeptic. And in a way, uh, Sexus Empiricus and the Peronian skeptics think um, that Socrates, too, uh, he wasn't a full-on Peronian skeptic because, of course, that was um, invented by Pyrrho, but in a way he made possible uh, it was a kind of like proto-Peronian skeptic as well. So um, whether or not Socrates was really a Platonist as uh, people interpret Plato and his views, whether or not he was really a Stoic or a skeptic or whatever, you know, um, I'll leave that up for you to decide. But we'll begin first by looking at that, the, the distinction among what Sextus Empiricus calls the fundamental a difference among philosophies. He says you can boil down all the different philosophies that existed in the ancient world according to three different types. Now the first type is the dogmatists. Right? So someone who is dogmatic is someone who um, is kind of stuck in their ways. Right? They refuse to budge. Now he says that the dogmatists are those who have, who claim to have discovered truth. They know how to know things, right, for certain. So this would include um, potentially Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, Epicureans, the Neoplatonists, and so on, right? Because they all have varying epistemologies where they say, you know, uh, it's through the mind alone, or no, you know, it's through like uh, an empirical method, whatever, that we come to know the truth, and like it's it's definitely the truth, right? No doubt. The next kind are the academic skeptics. Now, these are called the academic skeptics because they originated actually in Plato's Academy, where eventually the Academy was kind of um, overrun by these people that um, declare that truth could not be apprehended, that we could never know anything true. Um, but you actually get a, uh, some famous people later, like in the Roman era, like uh, Cicero, uh, who was a famous uh, Roman senator. Uh, other people, Carneades, uh, Clitomachus, and so on, right? So these people all claim it's impossible to know anything. Right? We cannot know what is true. So it's important to understand they're making a positive claim about a negative. Right? They're saying, it is true that we cannot know anything. This is different from the Peronian skeptics. Peronian skeptics, of the kind that Sextus Empiricus uh, is, they do not claim that truth is impossible. Instead, they say they are still investigating whether truth can be apprehended or not. So these would be people like uh, Pyrrho, Sexus Empiricus, Montaigne, who actually is a um, much later philosopher um, in the Renaissance uh, era, he, he lived in France, uh, and others are Peronian skeptics. Right? So you have the dogmatists who say uh, we can know truth, you have the academic skeptics who say we can't know truth, and then you have the Peronian skeptics who say I don't know if we can know truth or can't know truth. So they just suspend their judgment on that entirely. Sextus Empiricus says, by way of a, a preface, let us say that on one, uh, uh, sorry, on none of the matters to be discussed, do we affirm that things certainly are just as we say they are. Rather, we report descriptively on each item according to how it appears to us at the time. 
So we're going to see this is a very important um, caveat that they're not going to uh, try and argue why everyone is wrong and therefore they are they are wrong about you know whether or not um, the soul is material or immaterial or it's immortal or not right. Instead, they're only going to investigate claims purported by other people. So, Peronian skeptics never say anything about the things in themselves. They only investigate, right? So, they don't investigate, like, what is the nature of a chair? They only investigate what other philosophers say the nature of a chair is. And that's an important difference. So, they're basically skeptic uh, uh, skeptics of... Uh, philosophers, right? But they don't say that means that philosophy is worthless, right? Because that would be to say, well, we can't ever know anything that philosophy wants to know. Instead, they think they're actually being more serious about truth because they're not going to just be persuaded by some claim because it seems, you know, the logic seems sound and it seems reasonable, right? Instead, they're going to keep investigating because they're always competing claims. So, if the skeptics say they're still investigating whether we can know anything or not, we can rightfully ask, do skeptics, and now when I refer to skeptics, it's going to be only uh, the uh, Peronian skeptics, right? Not the academic skeptics. Do skeptics hold beliefs? So, Sexist Empiricus says, well, definitely, we hold beliefs if by you mean that, you know, uh, things were like uh, uh, assented to feel. So, he says, skeptics definitely assent to feelings that are forced on them by, like, appearances in the external world. Like, if I look out and I see it looks like snow, well, then, you know, we take it as given that it's snowing. Now, whether it really is snowing or not, right, that's a different matter. But if all of a sudden I start feeling hungry, right, well... It's not going to be that skeptics are going to say, well, I don't know if I'm hungry or not. You know, I'm going to... Now, they could investigate. How do I know whether I'm hungry or not, right? But they nonetheless are going to have a belief because they say it's just natural based on our psychology and our physiology that we cannot stop uh, feelings like that that just come upon us, right? But they do not affirm or deny whether or not they really are hungry. He says... For we coherently follow to all appearances an account which shows us a life in conformity with traditional customs and the law and persuasions and our feelings. Right? And because you might wonder, well, if Sexus Empiricus was a medical doctor, but he was also a Peronian skeptic, how could he be a medical doctor? How does he know if the medicine he's doing works or not? And it's because... Peronian skeptics do not deny custom. They live according to the customs. You know, Sexus Empiricus would go to the temple on the days it was a custom to go to the temple and worship the gods it was a custom to worship in ancient Rome. He would do all those things that it was a custom to do. Now, if he were to be pushed on that by a friend or by someone else, a philosopher or otherwise, as to whether there are really gods or not that he's worshiping, Sexist Empiricus could not defend that there are. But he also could not defend that there are not these gods he's worshipping. Only that it's just the thing that they do for someone that lives in the Roman world, right? At a time like that. So, in a way, yes, uh, they hold beliefs in a kind of a normal, everyday sense. Like, uh, if I, you know, uh, this appears to be water, I'm going to drink it. You know, I believe it's water. Carbonated water. But as to whether or not it's really water, right? If we can investigate the thing in itself, they do not hold a belief. They're not going to firmly say, yes, it's water. And I know it's water because I can give all these reasons. And all of you are wrong who try to argue that we can't know it's water, right? They would never uh, do that. So what exactly is Peronian skepticism then? If they... Uh, do hold beliefs, they follow customs and traditions, but they claim they're still investigating as to whether we can know things or not. Uh, what is the point, right? And what is their method for doing this? 
Empiricus says, skepticism is an ability to set out oppositions among things which appear and are thought of in any way at all. An ability which, because of the equivalence, meaning the um, competing contrary claims in the opposed objects and accounts, we come first to suspension of judgment and afterwards to tranquility. Right? So for Plato, he's going to say the essence of a thing is the form which is immaterial and exists in another realm that is not in our worldly realm. Aristotle is going to say the essence of a thing is thinghood is in the thing itself. Which one is correct? Sexus Empiricus is going to say, we don't know. But that doesn't mean we can't investigate uh, these competing claims, right? It's still possible one could be true or both could be false. And another answer about um, uh, what the essence of things uh, is. But it's important to understand what exactly happens when they undertake this setting out of oppositions and examine them. When they see competing claims, they investigate them, they find that there's this equivalence, right, where they each uh, seem to be uh, um, weighty in, in, in their claims and the logic and so on. So they come to a suspension of judgment, right? They uh, arrive at a standstill of the intellect where nothing is positive affirmatively or negatively. That's an important um, uh, concept to understand the suspension of judgment. This suspension of judgment in turn actually allows them to achieve ataraxia, the Greek word for tranquility, a kind of freedom from disturbance or a calmness of the soul, where, of course, if you think about it, most people, if you confront them about their beliefs, so if you come across um, I don't know, a practicing Christian, and uh, you ask, you know, well, how do you know, uh, you know, God is real? Look at these, like, contradictory claims in the Bible or, you know, whatever other argument you want to give, right? They're probably going to um, be offended. They're probably going to uh, dig in and, and try to defend their beliefs that they hold because they see as part of those beliefs as something in themselves that when they talk about those beliefs, they don't divorce it from themselves. Skeptics achieve a kind of freedom of the soul, right? This uh, calmness where they don't treat beliefs as parts of themselves, as essentially, right, who they are, where they would be offended if they were wrong about the belief they followed. This, they claim, allows them to um, more earnestly, right, pursue philosophical uh, truths. And in this way, there's a he wouldn't go so far as to say this is a virtue, but it's a kind of virtue, at least it appears, right? Now, whether or not it's truly a virtue, of course, Sexus Empiricus would never say, yes, achieving ataraxia is a virtue, because then he would say, well, I know something true, and it is, you know, how to live the good life, and it's by basically um, doing all, uh, you know, following the, the, the Pyrrhonist method. So... We said that uh, Peronian skeptics do not investigate things in themselves, but instead they only investigate what is said about such things. He says, for example, it appears to us that honey sweetens. We can see this in as much we are sweetened in a perceptual way. But whether, as far as the argument goes, it is actually sweet is something we investigate. And this is not what is apparent, but something said about what is apparent. So again, the Peronian skeptics are going to be concerned with claims we make about uh, the world and other ideas, right? They're not going to be concerned with the things in themselves, but only the arguments about them. So when they come to then um, uh, equivalent oppositions, these are crosswise examined in a way they think, again, <laughs> is similar to the Socratic method. But they think that they've really uh, followed uh, the Socratic method in, you know, in such a way that like Plato and Aristotle and others uh, fail to do. So what they do is they oppose what appears to what appears and what is thought of to what is thought of. And then they oppose what, is, uh, what appears to them, what is thought of about the thing that appears, and then what is thought of 
to what appears itself. Now, of course, again, they come to this understanding that there are these conflicting accounts then, as we can uh, understand about Aristotle and Plato as to the nature of the soul. But this doesn't mean necessarily that um, there's uh, competing accounts in, in, in like a contradictory logical sense, because again, that would be to say uh, really what is the nature of these, these claims. But it's only to say they both seem persuasive. And there doesn't seem to be a way to definitively judge which one is correct and which one is not. So he says the chief constitutive principle of skepticism is the claim that to every account, an equal account is opposed. For it is from this we think that we come to hold no beliefs. So anyone that puts forward a claim, and this is actually um, similar to what we saw Socrates argue about uh, Protagoras's argument in the Theaetetus, where he said, well, you know, if uh, Protagoras says that a human being is the measure of all things, well, we're you know always going to find more people who disagree with a certain claim. So that means more people would disagree with Protagoras. And if a human being is the measure of all things, then humanity as a whole, being in the majority of opinion that Protagoras is wrong, would render Protagoras's argument uh, wrong. This is a bit similar, where again, there's always going to be an equal account that is opposed to any other account we come across. So what's the point of this, right? What is the point of learning about Peronian skepticism? Why does Sexus Empiricus practice this? Well, we saw that they achieve by suspending judgment as to the truth of things, they achieve ataraxia, right? This uh, tranquility, the state of being calm, right? So you can think about yourself. What are the results when your beliefs are challenged? Again, you're probably going to um, feel like you really need to defend them because it's not just the beliefs that are being challenged, but it's something about you yourself, right? So you take it personally. So there's something practical. Sexist Empiricus thinks we can, uh, at least one thing, uh, we can gain from this, which is a way actually to be more humble. And in this way, I think we learn something in the um, method of Peronian skepticism and what Sexist Empiricus is advocating here, something that is lost in um, modern philosophy. So we'll definitely see later on with like Descartes and Hume and so on that really in the ancient Greek world and Roman world, uh, philosophy was not simply something you, you do when you go into the academy and you do your research and so you come to hold these beliefs based on your philosophical pursuits. And then when you come out of the university and you go home and hang out with friends and cook dinner, that like, you know, all that philo philosophy stuff, like that's back at the academy, right? That's kind of how like Hume and, and Descartes uh, view philosophy, right? It has its own place and then you don't do it in, you know, your, your other everyday um, excursions. With Sexus Empiricus and, and uh, more largely in the ancient Greek and Roman world, philosophy was a way of life, right? It was intimately bound up with how you would live. And in this way, then, we'll see there's a reason why, then, Sexus Empiricus argues skepticism is practical. He says, for those who hold the opinion that things are good or bad by nature are perpetually troubled. When they lack what they believe to be good, they take themselves to be persecuted by natural evils, and they pursue what, so they think, is good. And when they have acquired these things, they experience more troubles, for they are elated beyond reason and measure. And in fear of change, they do anything so as not to lose what they believe to be good. But those who make no determination about what is good and bad by nature neither avoid nor pursue anything with intensity, and hence, they are tranquil. Now, there are actually uh, many different ways um, Peronian skeptics achieve this tranquility. There are many different reasons why they suspend judgment. We're going to see there are 10 older modes that uh, Peronian skeptics would develop as kind of methods for approaching arguments. And then there are five newer ones that they uh, would approach. 
Now, the ten older modes of uh, the suspension of judgment can be uh, broken up into three different categories. So you have the modes deriving from the subject judging, the modes deriving from the object judged, and the modes which um, combine both of them. So for the mode, and we're going to look at um, uh, just the modes deriving from the subject judging, and only one of the modes um, from the object being judged itself, uh, just for sake of time. But the modes derived from the um, subject judging is going to look at, okay, who or what is coming to this claim about, you know, truth? What are the, the means by which they come to uh, these, these truth claims? And they're going to investigate that. Are there good reason to think that, right, whatever those means are, are reliable? Or the modes deriving from the object judged. What are the objects that we're judging, and is it possible that those things in themselves, right, could allow us then to know something about them, or that they could have some kind of objective truth about them? So let's look at the first older mode. This is that depending on variations among animals. Right, so someone might claim... Well, if human beings are rational uh, uh, animals, right? We can use reason to determine uh, whether something is true or not. Sexus Empiricus wants to use the uh, first older mode here and, and investigate. Okay, but how can we be so sure that we definitely know uh, the truth about the external world and animals don't? So external ob existing objects then uh, could be... <laughs> simply like the grass outside, um, whether or not the, you know, the sunshine causes plants to grow or otherwise, right, that these things should be observed as different depending on the different constitutions of the animals receiving the appearances. So, you know, for example, pigs find it pleasant to wash in mud and humans don't, right? So as to whether or not um, washing in mud is pleasurable, we know humans don't and yet pigs do find it pleasant. Perfume appears pleasant to humans, but perfume appears intolerable to bees and dung beetles. So, is it really true that perfume is pleasant, or is it not? Because these different animals, right, have these different responses to them. So we can see that there's uh, the appearance that results from uh, experiencing the perfume or the mud or whatever else it may be, right, these produce in animals from these uh, objects are different. So we can say how the objects are like is observed by us because we can say again, humans don't like washing in the mud, at least you know, typically. But as for their nature, we have to suspend judgment. Why? Sextus Empiricus says, for we shall not be able ourselves to decide between our own appearances and those of other animals being ourselves a part of the dispute, and for that reason, more in need of someone to decide than ourselves able to judge, right? If we are having, well, there's two, let me break it down like this. There's two simple reasons we could say. One is quite simply, if you have a dispute between two people, um, obviously it's not objective for the two people, uh, you know, the two parties engaged in the dispute to be the deciding judge, right? You would need um, an objective, nonpartisan judge to determine which one is true and which one is false, right? And of course, us human beings being part of the dispute, right, we're biased. But secondly, the fact that there are different sense capacities that would render pigs to enjoy bathing in mud and human beings to not enjoy that would mean that we might not be so sure about to what extent, right, our capacity to perceive the world around us gives us the true objective reality of that world. And maybe the pigs actually have a better account of that. So we're going to see um, just this reason uh, right here in better detail. So it's said, Sexus Empiricus says, that rational animals have language. All human beings by nature have language language because we are rational but he says what if a man is mute right so they can't talk 
Maybe they're you know born with a defect in their vocal cords or something like that. Would we say that just because that person couldn't talk, that therefore they don't possess reason, that they're irrational? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. And yet, he says, there are all kinds of animals who do display various sounds that others of those kinds of animals seem to respond to. Right? You might have a certain call being made, of course, by a bird that other birds will pick up on, where they can communicate about, hey, there's a prey around here, or, or, or sorry, there's a predator around here that's coming after us, or um, they might be, you know, having a mating call or something like that, where they seem to be able to understand what is being communicated. And furthermore, just because we hear, uh, as human beings, we hear a foreign language, right, and that we don't understand that foreign language, it doesn't mean that there's not rational dialogue in that language, right? If I hear um, Portuguese, I don't understand Portuguese, that doesn't mean, well, whoever speaking Portuguese is irrational and that language is irrational. That would be absurd. So, just because we can't uh, understand what it is that other animals could be communicating, at least it, it appears that they are communicating with these sounds, just because we can't understand it doesn't mean there's not language or that there's not rational language. And so, Sexus Empiricus argues, since animals appear to share in this, therefore, the so-called irrational animals could actually be said to share in reasoning as well. And furthermore, how can we be so sure that, right, our senses give us an objective account of the world when certain animals have senses that are far better than our own and seem to understand their place in the world better? Right? He gives the account of dogs. Dogs seem to be able to hear and smell far better than we can. Other animals, of course, can see far better than we can. So, should we say, then, in that respect, they are wiser? Ultimately, to judge right, that we possess reason and that other animals don't, that they are irrational, we would need, he argues, a kind of God's eye view, which, of course, we don't appear to possess. Now, we actually might, so he's not saying we don't possess that, that we we don't actually have this, you know, maybe reason, we do have reason, and reason is that God's eye view that we can use to know truth about the world. But we can't know for sure because we have these competing claims that can't be defeated uh, uh, each individually. He says, we are not able to prefer our own appearances to those produced in the irrational animals. And so therefore, we must suspend judgment as to whether or not uh, we are actually rational animals, and the other animals are irrational. Now, looking at the second older mode, that depending on the differences among humans, if we looked at the differences among um, human animals and non-human animals, now we can look just at humans. And we can know, of course, that humans make different claims about the world, which is why we have this problem in the first place. So, he gives four different examples where, take Pindar, he says, uh, Pindar says that one man is gladdened by the honors and garlands of his storm-footed horses, another by life in gilded places, another rejoices as he crosses the swell of the sea in swift ships, or Homer, who claims that different men rejoice in different deeds, and Euripides, who claims, if nature had made the same things fine and wise for all alike, there would be no disputatious strife among humankind. So, if the same things affect humans differently, depending on the differences among them, then suspension of judgment should be introduced, since we we can um, since we can't say how each thing actually you know uh, really is in itself, but only how it appears. We can say that it appears different. Men enjoy. Um, life in gilded places, and other ones enjoy, you know, going across the sea on um, adventures or whatever, right? But as to which one is, is the best, we can't say anything like that. So he says, when the self-satisfied dogmatists, right, all those philosophers who claim to know uh, truth, 
say that they themselves should be preferred to other humans in judging things, we know that their claim is absurd, for they are themselves a part of the dispute. And if it is by preferring themselves that they judge what is apparent, then by entrusting the judging to themselves, they are taking for granted the matter being investigated before beginning the judging. Right? So if they are going to assume that they possess this thing called reason and therefore can come to know the truth about things and that they can know it better than other people, they are already beginning with an assumption that is unproven. And we'll see exactly, um, I think, in a closer detail oh, what kind of problem that is later when we look at the uh, five newer modes. For the third older mode, that, depending on the differences among the senses, we can look at not just human beings, but even ourselves, just each individual, and the five different senses we have. So, we know that um, in the Theotetus and with uh, Aristotle and on the soul, that different senses, right, perceive different things from different objects, and that if we could only, like, see something, we would lose something as to, you know, how it sounds and touches and, and something, right? That we would lose an account of the, the true nature of that thing. But more than that, Sextus Empiricus says that, for example, honey is pleasant to the tongue, right? We, we like to eat honey, we say it's sweet, but it's not pleasant to the eyes, right? Put honey in your eyes, it's not going to feel good. The same is with perfume to smell and taste, right? So, perfume can smell nice, does not taste nice. So, it's impossible to say whether these things are really pleasant or unpleasant, although, of course, again, we can still say how it appears on that said occasion. Furthermore, the senses fail, right? We can look at, if we take a glass of water and we put a straw in there, the straw is going to look bent. Or think about, off in the distance, we might see a mirage and we think that there's something there, when really there's not because the senses fail. And you might say, well, yes, but we take the straw out and we know that's really not bent. Or, you know, we come uh, upon that thing eventually that's off in the distance and we see that it was just a mirage. Okay, true. But how can you always be sure that in that moment your senses are not failing you? How can you not be sure that what you're seeing is an illusion? It would require another sense perception, right? And then how can you be sure about that one? So we might see that this might fall victim to infinite regress later on with the uh, five uh, newer modes. But besides the fact that senses take in different perceptions and the senses are known to fail, couldn't it be possible we are missing a sixth sense? How can we be so sure that we have all the senses per to perceive all the possible things in the world? So Sextus says, let us conceive of someone who from birth has touch, smell, and taste, but who hears and sees nothing. He will suppose that there is absolutely nothing visible or audible, and that there exist only those three kinds of quality which he is able to grasp. So it is possible that we too, having only the five senses, grasp from among the qu uh, qualities of the apple only those we are capable of grasping, Although other qualities can exist, impressing other sense organs in which we have no share, so that we do not grasp the objects perceptible by them. Right? It would be uh, pretty presumptuous of us to say that, well, we can definitely know the truth of the nature of things in the world because we have the five senses which allow us to perceive these things. Because how can we be so sure there's not another sense that would actually allow us to come to understand the nature of that thing more accurately. And of course, we do know there are many things we can't perceive, right? There's uh, infrared light and other things which our body as it is cannot perceive. And you might say, well, yes, but we can use instrumental tools as a kind of sixth sense, right? To perceive infrared light and other things like that. Sure. But how do you know that that still gives us access to the nature of the world. What if there's still something else we're missing? And then we go on making all these arguments about, ah, oh, this is how the world really is, when 
Maybe in the future we could come uh, uh, um, upon another discovery which shows us why actually, well, well, it turns out we were wrong because we were lacking another uh, possible sense as well. So if the senses do not apprehend then external objects, the intellect um, is not able to apprehend them either. So again, one would have to suspend judgment regarding then uh, external objects in the world, right? So every time, as you can see, um, we come to suspend judgment and achieve ataraxia. Now, the tenth older mode, right, is not concerned with the means by which we come to know things, but instead that which is being judged. And for this one, uh, Sexist Empiricus looks at um, different customs, beliefs, persuasions, and what he calls dogmatic suppositions, so specifically uh, philosophical arguments. He says that what we can do is actually oppose different customs to different customs. We can oppose customs to laws, different myths to different laws, and so on. Whereby none of them, right, is able to proceed from a foundational standpoint which says that is necessarily um, uh, what is true. And the other myths or, you know, like uh, the, the law that we follow is more true than the myth and so on. So he says for those customs then that are opposed to customs... Some of the Ethiopians tattoo their babies, while we do not. The Persians deem it uh, becoming to wear brightly colored, full-length dresses, while we deem it unbecoming. Indians have sex with women in public, while most other people hold that it is shameful. Well, which one is correct? Which is the correct custom? Again, right? We're finding these different claims to be equivalent. Laws opposed to laws. He says, in Rome, anyone who renounces his father's property does not repay his father's debts. While in Rhodes, he repays them come what may. Or what about different myths or you know, religious beliefs that someone might follow? He says, we say in one place that the mythical father of gods and men is Zeus, and in another that he is Ocean, citing Ocean, source of the gods, and Tethys, their mother. Or finally, what about the dogmatic suppositions of the different philosophers? He says, some people assert there is one element, right? They could be a monist to say, well, everything is really material or everything is really spirit. Others say infinitely many, right? They could be a pluralist. Some that the soul is mortal, like Aristotle. Others immortal, like Plato. Some that human affairs are directed by divine providence. And other philosophers say human affairs are not directed by um, uh, uh, by providence, right? So they, uh, there could be free will. Which one is correct? He says, since we cannot say what each existing object is, again, in its nature, because we have these equally competing claims, we only can see how each one appears relative to a, a given persuasion or the law or the custom. So what must we do? Suspend judgment as to which one is truly correct. Now, that doesn't mean you don't follow the custom in Rome, right? He would still follow the custom, even though he can't prove that it's definitely, you know, like the thing one should do. Only that he doesn't know whether or not it really is the thing one should do or not, right? It's just what appears what one, one does in that context, right? In that, in that culture. So, of course, we've been dealing with um, external objects in the world with these um, and, and, and customs, right? Um, so empirical things uh, in the world with the ten older modes. With the five newer modes, which come from uh, the Pyrrhonist Agrippa, these are concerned more with the logic of arguments itself, right? The claims specifically being made about those external objects, regardless of, um, you know, the nature of those external objects. And we have five different ones. So the first one is that deriving from dispute. The second is um, basically when your argument just goes on to infinity for uh, justification. It never has you know, um, any argument that stands by itself. Uh, the third is an argument that is derived from relativity. The fourth is what he calls the hypothetical, or basically it's uh, a foundationalist argument where you just have to assume that something is the case. And the, the fifth one 
is basically uh, begging the question. It's a, a circular argument. So I want to read through actually um, how these five different modes work. So he says, what is proposed is either an object. So anytime someone makes a philosophical argument, that what is proposed by them is either an object of perception, right? It's a claim about something we perceive in the world, or it's an object of thought. And whichever it is, is subject to dispute. For according to some, only objects of perception are true, right? So maybe an empiricist. According to others, only objects of thought, so maybe a rationalist. And according to yet others, some objects of perception and some objects of thought are true. Now, will they say that the dispute is decidable or undecidable? Now, of course, if they say it's undecidable, then we have it that we must suspend judgment, right? You know, straight away, if you're a pianist, you would just immediately suspend judgment because maybe you've already dealt with those arguments before and investigated them. But, um, but if, if, you know, that person claims, no, we can actually decide whether or not we can know things by perception or by thought alone, he says, well, we shall ask where the decision is to come from. For instance, is an object of perception, or we shall rest the argument on this first, to be decided by an object of perception or by an object of thought? So if we want to know whether or not I'm actually seeing in front of me a computer, do I rely on another perception about the computer or some thought about it? He says, if we say an object of perception, then since we are investigating objects of perception, this too will need something else to make it convincing. And if this further thing also is an object of perception, it too will again need something further to make it convincing. And so ad infinitum, right? So uh, an, an infinite regression here of arguments. Because if I say, well, I know that's a computer because I can touch it. I say, well, yeah, but how do you know you're really touching it? What if it's, you know, a dream? And you're saying, well, because every time uh, I see this computer, it always turns out to do the things I want, right? And then you say, yeah, but how do you know again that uh, just because you're using it, that it's really doing the things you want? And you say, well, because it's, it, it's plugged in, right? I see it's plugged into the outlet. Well, how do you know there's really electricity going through there and so on, right? I would just need to continuously give onto infinity, um, more empirical claims. And that, of course, can't be justified because it's an infinite regression. But if the object of perception needs to be decided by an object of thought, so maybe we don't have to rely on perception to know that the computer is in front of us. Maybe we can just use reason alone. Then he says, since objects of thought are also in dispute, it too, being an object of thought, that there's a computer in front of me, will need to be judged and made convincing. Now, where will it get its conviction from? If it's going to get it from an object of thought, the business will proceed ad infinitum in the same way that we saw with if you rely on perceptions. But if from an object of perception then, since so how do we know that our uh, reasoning about it, right, the thought we have about it is true, then we want to rely on perception, maybe someone else sees it as well. Then, uh, since an object of thought was adduced to make the object of perception convincing and an object of perception for the object of thought, we have brought in the reciprocal mode. So we have actually made it circular because we've said, well, I perceive this thing to be in front of me and I uh, can give a reasoned argument for why well, how do you know this reason the argument is true? Well, I can say because, you know, um, I perceive it to be this way. Well, then I've just made a circular argument because I've said, how do I know I see it? Basically, because I see it. So if to avoid this, then, our interlocutor, the one who we might be questioning here, claims to assume something by way of concession and without proof in order to prove what comes next, then the hypothetical mode is brought in, and there is no way out, right? And this is actually what we'll see later uh, Rene Descartes does, where um, he tries to make a claim where it is self-evident, where it doesn't need justification. Sexus Empirica says that's when someone just makes an assumption. They have to assume it's true to go on in order to prove that it is true. 
And that would be illogical. Right? He's claiming. For if he is convincing when he makes his hypothesis, we will keep hypothesizing the opposite and will be no more unconvincing. And if he hypothesizes something true, he makes it suspect by taking it as a hypothesis rather than establishing it. While if it is false, the foundation of what he is trying to establish will be rotten. Again, if hypothesizing something achieves anything towards making it convincing, why not hypothesize the object of investigation itself rather than something else through which he is supposed to establish the object about which he's arguing? If it is absurd to hypothesize the object under investigation, right? It's absurd to just assume it's true to be able to prove, you know, something else is true. It will be absurd to hypothesize what is superordinate to it. Now, that all objects of perception are relative is clear, of course, that I perceive this laptop is, is here, of course, is relative to my eyes and my ability for my brain to process then, um, you know, the, the, the sensory perception. So it is, it is thus evident that whatever perceptible object is uh, proposed to us may easily be referred to the five modes. And of course, if it's, uh, you know, um, if I'm just simply claiming, well, it's because I judge it that it's there because I can perceive it, again, like that's not a, a defensible claim because anyone can claim they see anything, and of course that doesn't mean it's really there. So we failed here in starting from proving external objects. Now what about, so basically the empiricist, like sorry, you know, uh, sexist empiricist is saying, whether or not we can really come to know things empirically, we will have to suspend judgment. But what about rationally? What about just through the use of reason alone, through thought? He says, we make similar deductions about objects of thought. For if the dispute about them is said to be undecidable, again, they will have granted us that we must suspend judgment about them. So that would be the first mode. But if the dispute is to be decided, then if this comes by way of an object of thought, we will throw them back at infinitum. Again, right? Because then you're just relying on other uh, thoughts which you would have to justify by other thoughts, and that would have to be justified by another thought, and so on. While if by an object of perception, we will throw them back on the reciprocal mode, because then how do you justify that? It would have to come back then to an object of thought, and so you've just gone in a circle. For the object of perception itself is, uh, it, sorry, is itself subject to dispute, and being unable to be decided through itself because of the infinite regress, it will require an object of thought in just the same way as the object of thought required an object of perception. So anyone who, for these reasons, assumes something as, an, as a hypothesis will again turn out to be absurd, right? If they then have to say, as we'll see, you know, later on Descartes uh, has to proceed from the fact that um, it's impossible to um, argue that one does not exist because it's self-evident. Um, sexist empiricist would claim if he was alive and had encountered Descartes, he would, he would claim, well, that's just a, a hypothetical um, argument being made that's not defensible, right? So therefore, it's, uh, you know, we suspend judgment as to whether or not we really exist or not. And um, yeah, so and anyone who for this, these reasons assumes something as a hypothesis will again turn out to be absurd, and objects of thought are relative to. They are called objects of thought relative to the thinker, right? So they, it would be a subjective claim. And if they were by nature such as they are said to be, there would have been no dispute about them in the first place. So if the object of thought wasn't relative to the person, we could say, well, no, everyone has reason. And in that way, it's universal. It's not relative. Then sexist empiricist would say, well, yeah, but then there would have never been dispute as to whether or not your claim is true or not. But there is a dispute. So therefore, we suspend judgment. Thus, objects of thought, too, are referred to the five modes. And for that reason, it is absolutely necessary for us to suspend judgment about the object proposed. So we've seen the 10 different older modes as to how we come to suspend judgment about um, uh, external objects. We've seen the five newer modes here about how we come to sus suspend judgment about um, uh, the claims based on their logic alone, whether they be um, 
you know, external objects or um, uh, thoughts in our mind. So we've seen then the uh, pureness, uh, the different pureness methods. So uh, I am really curious because of Sextus Empiricus's claim that Peronian skepticism is practical. Do you find Peronian skepticism to offer a, ther a therapeutic cure to dogmatism and philosophy or just yourself in your everyday life? And uh, I think another question as well would uh, be interesting for you to consider because, again, many people in the ancient world claimed of the, the um, skeptics that, well, if I were to really be a skeptic and suspend judgment about things, I would just die of inactivity because I just had to sit here not knowing if anything around me was, you know, really there or not, knowing if, not knowing whether or not this water was true or not. So I might, um, you know, truly water or not. So I might die of uh, dehydration. And you can find um, uh, uh, his defense of uh, why Peronian skeptics you know, don't fall to this uh, inactivity argument, um, uh, pages 8 uh, and 9. 